I wanted to start uh, with Ukraine because it seems as though that conflict has heated up now in ways it hadn't prior. Yes, it has. The, there are numerous reports, I haven't seen any official confirmation, that the Ukrainians have begun a second incursion into Russia. And they're only using apparently a few hundred troops. Uh, one report said 300. But they're moving very quickly and they're occupying a lot of land. Now, of course, the Russian army at this point, uh, with casualties of about a thousand a day, and a casualty for those who aren't familiar is not necessarily a killing. It can mean you're injured and, or sick and taken out of the battlefield. So the loss of those soldiers, their, their casualties to the conflict, thousand a day. And the Russian army, which has no sergeants for you know close in tactical decisions, uh, is now largely populated with uh, conscripts and uh, criminals uh, taken out of the prisons. So this is not a highly motivated army. Uh, one of the problems the Ukrainians are uh, going to face soon is the growing number of prisoners of war where the soldiers gave up to them. Of course, having done that, if they get exchanged back to Mother Russia, that may be the end of their existence. Sure. Uh, given Putin's behavior. But the goal, it appears to some of the military analysts right now, is to occupy as much Russian territory as the Russians have taken in Ukraine, which has the smell of a swap to it, Sure. to bring about an end to this. In addition, the Ukrainians, whose military tactics I think will be widely studied around the world for hundreds of years to come, uh, they've been very smart about cutting off supply lines. So there are a number of bridges into the area that the uh, Russians now control, in the, the uh, I'm sorry, the Ukrainians now control in Russia. And, and the Russian soldiers, you know, they left their dogs behind. They left uh, half-eaten meals behind. I mean, they ran when they heard the Ukrainians were approaching. They have not totally destroyed bridges. What they've done is the same tactic they used earlier, with precision artillery, they put potholes uh, or damage in the bridge so you can take a Toyota and maneuver your way very slowly across the bridge, but you can't take a tank, you can't take a five-ton truck uh, or any other heavy equipment across them. And that means that resupply is a serious problem for the Russian army. And all of this, of course, is putting pressure on Putin where... Even Russian media, where the state, you know, can throw you in prison if they don't like what you're uh, reporting, is saying that, you know, mothers of conscripts and girlfriends of conscripts are saying to the government, what are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, so public opinion, Russian culture, will people will suffer a lot, but it appears that uh, there is now resistance uh, to that. And for those of you watching on the internet, uh, there's a wonderful picture up that shows the kind of precision degradation yeah. of yes degradation of bridges rather than destruction of them yeah and those are even more than potholes right i mean they're potholes yes uh, potholes is a weak word i apologize no 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 not not so, not so much that but just to let people know who are listening on podcast they're giant holes in this bridge so uh, it makes a, uh, it, it's a it's fascinating to hear you talking about that military strategy that i was unaware of uh, i've seen that russia is now launching more missiles into Ukraine, trying to take out vital infrastructure there. So I'd suggest, uh, based on what you're saying, they're trying to maybe navigate toward, I'm talking about the Ukrainians now, based on their incursions, navigate towards some settlement, some negotiation, certainly some leverage. And yeah, at the that, same time, would, the Russians are taking it to a different place too. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that seems to be a more than reasonable interpretation here. Zelensky from day one has said there'll be no settlement without giving back our land, and that's presumed to include Crimea, which you'll recall in 2014 when Obama was president, uh, men in uniforms but without insignia appeared. And Putin at the time said, of course, those aren't my soldiers. Everybody else was calling him uh, Putin's little green men. Of course, once he had secured Crimea and gotten this uh, vote, quote unquote vote, uh, to become part of Russia, he went, well, of course, those were my soldiers. 
<laughs> and remember in all of this that in 1993, the Russian government in writing pledged to never invade Ukraine if it would turn over the nuclear weapons that were there to Russia. Uh, so Putin has no regard for agreements that have been made. And he's following the uh, ancient Russian tradition that there are no rules in war. It's perfectly okay to attack hospitals and uh, old people's homes uh, and, and uh, uh, places like that, which are clearly not in any civilized society military targets. But the Russians have done this, at least going back as far as I've read into the uh, middle of the 19th century. Two, two points. Uh, one, uh, I'd like to uh, follow up on that Crimea thing in a second. But I, uh, two, want to ask you about that guarantee that we made, the West made to Ukraine when they turned the nukes over. We sort of said, hey, don't worry, we got you. You know, you don't have to worry about uh, if there's some kind of military attack or the, the, the West will cover you. Can you speak to that, David? Well, I think that in the Obama administration in 2014, they were not firm enough. I don't think Obama had the support in the Congress to be tougher. Than when he, he went was. into Crimea, when when Putin went into Crimea, and Putin went into Crimea, and the Russian, uh, the Ukrainian people in February of 2014 rose up and overthrew the Putin puppet who had built this palace so uh, that nobody knew about because it was behind a, a high uh, wall and had. Multiple, multiple you know, huge numbers of acres around it. In Biden's case, he was cautious in defending, and it's only now that the Ukrainians are getting our be uh, almost best fighter planes. Uh, we withheld a lot of lethal weaponry from them, uh, I, apparently out of a belief that we don't want to provoke, poke the bear, and provoke a much larger. A conflict. I, I think in retrospect, that was a mistake. I thought it was a mistake at the time. I was of the view that, uh, well, we don't want to have American or NATO soldiers on the ground. We should be giving the Ukrainians every weapon they think they need. And if we want to put a control on them, you can't attack anything but a military target inside Russia and say maybe only within the 100 kilometers, uh, uh, 60 miles. That's fine. But we should have been much tougher on the weaponry and much quicker. I mean, we didn't provide our best tanks to them until this year. Uh, yeah, I think it's those interesting how we, we've, uh, we've tried to split that baby, particularly going back to 2014, and it really hasn't worked out so well. Um, no. uh, but uh, but this the idea that they'd fold Crimea, as you've noted, into some kind of settlement is is fascinating as well. But um, yeah. And I, I, I don't want anybody to think that I'm somebody who's in favor of war. I'm very much against that and I want human beings to get past war, you know, as quickly as we possibly can. But I don't expect it will happen, unfortunately, in my lifetime. Yeah, um, sadly, it's a default position for um, all too many cultures and societies. Uh, so obviously, that's an ongoing thing. The other ongoing thing happening domestically is associated with the upcoming election, with just you know a few months to go. Uh, the question of certification has become something that's really relevant, particularly in the state of Georgia, where we've seen now this plan to not certify. This is something that you and I have spoken of before over the weeks. Essentially, it's a plan to uh, prevent certification of the vote in various counties in Georgia and, and somehow doing that, throw the vote into question, you know, muddy the water that way. Now, what's happened just yesterday is that there is a group of Democratic lawyers who have put together a uh, case, I think it's a 39-page argument, to try to uh, take that voter, cer uh, voter certification law that was passed, which allowed essentially uh, any administrator to block certification now to take that policy to court in Georgia. Can you speak to that, David? Because you, you're the legal mind here. Well, the, I think it's very clear at this point that there's been a broad legal strategy on how do we try to put the election uh, into the House of Representatives where each state gets one vote and which would likely uh, result in favoring the Republicans because of the fact that there are lots of small states, uh, relatively lightly populated states like the Dakotas and Wyoming, uh, which will have a Republican or Republican rep representative or representatives. 
in the Georgia case, what they've done is essentially empowered an attack on anybody who casts a vote anywhere in the state. The difficulty it poses is this, there's an extremely tight legal deadline for certifying the election results. It's not like, well, we can litigate this and it'll go on for 21 months. It has to get done uh, in a matter of, uh, somewhere I read six days, but I think it's longer than that. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact time period, but it's, I mean, you know, the election's November 5th, the inauguration is January 20th. So we're talking about uh, 10 month, 10 weeks. And gumming up the works, throwing the validity of the election into doubt is clearly a strategy. And it's a strategy of people who don't believe in democracy and who uh, don't have regard for uh, what their fellow citizens want. And the, unfortunately, with the judges who've been appointed by Trump, if they get these cases, as we've seen with Judge Eileen Cannon, they may issue cockamamie rulings, and that takes a long time to sort them out. So, I mean, I think there's a potential for real trouble here. Um, and Georgia is one of those states which could go either way. Well, look, let's face it, in the last election, Biden won it by that 11,700 and, you know, 80. 99. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 79. Um, so uh, you're, you're so very right. And it becomes a template, doesn't it, David, for that kind of blocking of the certification becomes a template for other states like Arizona, for example. Yeah, Arizona is the other good example of this. And, you know, the, in the 2020 election, uh, Republicans who were elected or appointed as the leaders of election units, county and state level, have across the board said there was no uh, measurable or significant cheating most of the cases that have been brought for double voting have been against Republicans who were supporting Donald Trump, even though the accusations have been against the Democrats. Uh, no significant evidence of people voting who uh, are not American citizens who can't vote in federal and state elections. Uh, let me be clear, all across America, elections for things like school boards, school budgets, water districts, mosquito districts, uh, you generally don't have to be a citizen to vote in those. You only have to be a local resident. My school district, I meet people all the time who are immigrants to America. They're professors at RIT or the University of Rochester or employees of one of the high-tech companies here. And they can vote in the school board elections, but they can't vote in the presidential elections. And undermining confidence in democracy is a core strategy of Vladimir Putin, President Xi, dictator Kim, the um, uh, mullahs in Tehran, uh, all of them want to undermine faith and trust in democracy. Well, I will get to, um, you know, sadly, there, there's a lot uh, less to undermine than there used to be. <laughs> I, I feel as though this democracy uh, teeters in, in many ways and that, you know, you have the the calls coming from the inside of the house type thing when it comes to this horror movie that is uh, the election. And finally, uh, on, on this question of the states, I'm just seeing that an Arizona judge set that trial date for January 5th, 2026. These are the people being tried in the criminal conspiracy to overturn the 2020 election, David. These are the people right. who are the fake electors. This whole plan, I mean, it, it, it's... It's utterly insane that this would be a 2026 case for laws that were broken, uh, allegedly, in 2020. Absolutely. And uh, when I read that it was moved to 2026, I thought it was a typo. That couldn't be true. So I went from the headline to the article and went, oh, my God. You know, the right to a speedy trial is not only the right of a defendant. It is also the right of the people that is the prosecution. Because when you delay, witnesses forget, their memories get cloudy, uh, people disappear, people die, people get sick. Uh, we want to have speedy trials. And I can't imagine any reason in the world to delay this trial about the 2020 election to 2026 with one possible exception. If there's a five-year statute of limitations and something goes awry with that case, uh, 
they won't be, they, I suspect, will not be able under Arizona law to go back and uh, reindict the uh, suspects in the case. Uh, delay, 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 of course, has been what Donald learned from uh, his, as he calls him, second father, Roy Cohn, back in the late 1960s and early 70s. And it's been a very effective strategy for him. Uh, and it's now been widely adopted. I mean, we really need to call out people who don't want to play fair. Democracy to work has to have some reasonable fairness. I'm not being Pollyannish. I, people are going to have robust debate. There's going to be uh, uh, lots of uh, vigorous arguments. Some people are going to behave badly. But what you're seeing the Trumpers do is try to institutionalize dishonesty. And that's part of a much bigger trend in this country. We've talked a little about in the past. The Supreme Court has pretty much legalized a bribery of public officials. You know, as long as you don't say, hey, Mark, as a U.S. senator, if uh, I give you this $50,000, will so you do that for me? And I just say, gee, Mark, it'd be really nice if you could help me with this problem. And then later I tip you with $50,000. Um, it's not a crime, according to our Supreme Court, which the founders uh, would be rolling in their graves. And if, if anybody listening or watching wants to know more about this, there's a wonderful book by Zephyr Teachout. What a cool name. That's Zephyr a very Teachout, cool name. Yeah. Who is, uh, she, she is a professor of law at, I believe, Fordham in New York City. Uh, run for office, didn't do well. Uh, but it is about the framers of our Constitution being concerned not about individual venality. There will always be individual people who do corrupt things. The concern of the framers of our Constitution was institutional corruption. And she makes a compelling case. You don't need to be a lawyer. You don't have to have an advanced education to understand it. It's, it's well-written. Uh, and it's not that long. I, as you talk about, you know, the institutionalizing of these misdeeds or playing the edges, uh, I think, wow, this is a fake elector scheme. I mean, this is a massive, yeah. bold face criminal endeavor. As you say, I mean, it, it's not that, you know, it, it, it makes gerrymandering seemed like Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, you know, it's, and I, and I'm, uh, I'm astounded that, and you're right, it, that's got to be it. It's got to be, oh, I'm going to extend this time out so that essentially the clock runs out on this case. Right. And, and you know, there, there are some historical antecedents to this. Uh, in the 1960s, there were alternative slates put forward for nominating conventions uh, in the Democratic Party. But they had to get approved in order to get in there. Sure, people knew they were alternate slates. That's right. These were falsification of documents, lying on the documents, um, and and a, a, a criminal conspiracy to undermine our election system. And that that should be offensive to everybody. Um, uh, but I think we're going to see more of this. And the reason is that back in either 1969 or 70, when I didn't have any gray hair. Um, uh, there were stories that I read by colleagues of mine at the San Jose Mercury saying that, you know, in 50 years, the year 2020, if the Republicans didn't change, uh, they were going to become a permanent minority party because the demographics of the country were changing. Education, skin color, religiosity, some other factors. And as one of my best friends uh, said to me when we had lunch about this, I don't know, five years ago, and I, I brought it up, he looked at me and you know, he said, but they can't change. The Republicans are who they are. They cannot change. And I think he's right. Just as ExxonMobil is never going to be a green company, the Republican Party is not going to embrace uh, multiculturalism and especially since Trump, regard. That's a word we really need to bring back into our society, having regard for others. What Trump calls woke, I call regard. And at RIT, where we have the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, and deaf people who come to RIT for an education make incredibly more money uh, over, the life, over their lifetime than those who go to other institutions or don't get any advanced education. Um, they put us through three days of training about what amounts to regard for others. 
uh, people who are not like you. And it was, I've been through training sessions like this. This was the best I have ever been to. It was polished, it was thoughtful, it was rounded, and it was deeply informing. And so I, there's a word I want, I really want to get back in our language. It's regard. Well, I don't know that 333 days of uh, regard classes would help uh, anyone involved mm -hmm. in the Trump campaign or uh, in this uh, uh, this GOP move to, as you suggested, sort of uh, uh, take elections as opposed to uh, win elections. So in our last couple of seconds here, David, I just want to quickly address um, a yeah. couple of things that really have uh, come up. Uh, and I think you can dispense with them pretty quickly. Uh, one of them is uh, the debate. Uh, it struck me as uh, Donald Trump working the refs, as I've said, where he's complaining about ABC, sort of being behind enemy lines, nobody likes me, et cetera, while he's you know, talking about George Stephanopoulos and David, et cetera. Um, uh, he'll debate, won't he? I mean, I don't think there's any question. I don't know if he's going to show up or not. I mean, Donald oh, really? is afraid. Oh, really? Donald is afraid of her, and he should be afraid of her. She spent 18 years as a grade prosecutor in Alameda County, which is uh, Oakland. And she did every kind of case you can imagine, and she learned, and she was held in high regard. I mean, there are plenty of defense lawyers who've come out publicly and other prosecutors who say she was an excellent courtroom prosecutor. And given that she has the uh, strength of character that Donald doesn't have and the ability to not take the bait on anything, uh, I'm not surprised Donald is afraid. I posted some time ago, and I do not mean in any way to be demeaning to Kamala Harris, what I'm about to say, I mean to be demeaning of Donald Trump. But to Donald, she's not a person or a woman, she's a mere girl. Well, Donald's afraid of a girl. Wow. Oh, and I think that just tells you volumes about who he is. I mean, Donald is used to having women around him who are either subservient to him, dependent on him, or in the few cases where they've somewhat stood up to him, they are women who were able to negotiate very well parts of his personality. Um, Barbara Rez, who worked for him for years, Maggie Haberman at the New York Times, they're the among the few women who've been able to stand up to him and and get him to respond differently, but not this is a, this is a real danger to Donald. And I well, think he, he, uh, danger or not, David. Apparently, uh, apparently, Kim, are you saying this is breaking news that he has reached an agreement? Mm -hmm. Is that the? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, it looks like he is, yeah, he is saying that he on Truth Social he posted. Yeah, looks like a debate is going to happen. Uh, he says he's reached an agreement with the Harris campaign related to the September 10th debate in Pennsylvania. On Truth Social today, he said it will be held on ABC News and that the rules will be the same as the debate between um, him, he and President Biden. This as the Trump and Harris campaigns have been going back and forth on what the rules for that planned debate would be. Oh, but I guess they was... struck a deal and off we go. No. The key rule there that was in dispute was microphones, on or mm -hmm. off when it's not your turn. And uh, so, well, let's be, if he shows up, that'll be very interesting. To, and I suspect Kamala will wipe the floor with him. It's interesting, David. You know, it's a media event. You know, it's not really a debate of issues. And, you know, right. you, I, I thought he, uh, I don't know why he would want to change from ABC. They essentially challenged nothing of what he said in the last debate. He was a fire hose of lies. Uh, Biden melted down, which, of course, helped him enormously. So no one was on stage challenging his lies. Uh, but ABC, you know, and, and to be fair to ABC, when you're the moderator of a debate, you're not there to take on the candidate with every falsehood and misrepresentation. So uh, it, it's, again, it's an interesting thing, not really a debate debate, but it's called a debate. It's a media event. It's it's really personality driven with some facts attached. Uh, I don't know. It's an interesting um, uh, phenomenon, uh, this debate thing. It's become I, an event in American politics. If, if you do fact checking on the run, even if you're thoroughly prepared because you know the kind of lies Donald is going to tell, I think you lose a lot of people and they get lost in the woods. What I would watch for in this debate is that uh, Kamala Harris will try to get under his skin, to mock him, to make fun of him, because Donald has no capacity to laugh at himself. And anybody who's a parent, if you can't learn to laugh at yourself, I can assure you when your kids are growing up, they're not going to be optimal human beings. Yeah. <laughs> and Donald has no capacity to do this. So uh, uh, 
when the debate comes, just look for her to to poke him in ways that he can't deal with, that make fun of him. In the last 30 seconds, David K. Johnston, tell me what you think of the RFK Jr. Tulsi Gabbard phenomenon with the uh, strong, I mean, they're really campaigning for Donald Trump now with the promise of positions within his administration. What a sad, sad case Robert F. Kennedy is. And I don't think Tulsi Gabbard is going to affect hardly anybody in terms of votes. But I mean, here's a man whose siblings have all come out and said, you have disgraced the memory and honor of our father. This is a guy who who confessed that he, he uh, took a bear he was going to eat in his apartment, in the apartment he uses in New York. He, he apparently actually lives in California, judges ruled. And he, he didn't have time to cook it, so he took it over into Central Park and made it look like it had been hit by a car or something. I mean, exactly. What yeah. this is this is just childish, and it it he um, uh, I don't know if he's going to help Donald or not. He might on the margin. There are enough people who buy this nonsense about about vaccines uh, that maybe it'll help him. But I suspect everybody who's a serious anti-vaxer is already with Trump. If forgetting sure. that he bragged that he was the genius behind getting uh, vaccines developed so quickly. Yeah, it's an odd place that they find themselves, the anti-vaxxers with Trump. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of political oddities these days. Uh, David, yes. so grateful that we can uh, spend some time talking to you here. Again, David can be found across the media ecosphere and i see you everywhere and you're you know i appreciate you putting us on the dance card but rit is your um is your new office rochester wonderful, Institute of Technology. wonderful place it turns out with a lot of wonderful faculty and students i i'm thoroughly thrilled and i'll look forward to talking with you next week all right good stuff david k johnson everybody hi it's mark and i thought that was great hit the notification bell you'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.